In this edition of Flying Through Time, we follow the Grumman Company's success as a builder of some of the world's best carrier planes. The Grumman Hellcat has been hailed as the plane that won the Pacific Theater during World War II. The Intruder and the first swing-wing fighter, the F-111, are two other examples of the Grumman stable. However, in this episode, we're going to move the clock forward and take a look at the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. The original F-14A had two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engines capable of producing a total of 41,800 pounds of thrust. Later models of the F-14 incorporated two General Electric F-110 engines, which in afterburner mode produced a total of 54,000 pounds of thrust. The F-14 Tomcat is considered a large fighter. It's 63 foot long, 16 foot high, and has a maximum wingspan of 61 foot 1 inch. The F-14's cruise speed is approximately 610 miles per hour, and it has a maximum speed of 1,544 miles per hour, or nearly Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. The Tomcat is the military's second swing-wing jet fighter. The first was the F-111. The Tomcat carried a wider range of armament than any other fighter before it. The two 20mm cannons were for close dogfighting. Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles were for targets between the ranges of 2.5 miles to 13 miles. With an 80-mile flight capacity, the new Phoenix missile took care of long-range targeting. Grumman's 303 airframe was extremely innovative for its time. However, the engines weren't as advanced. Grumman decided to fit engines that had a proven record. They chose the TF-30. Unfortunately, during the late 1970s, some F-14s experienced very substantial engine problems. They were serious enough to consider the prospect of developing entirely new engines for the aircraft. This would have been an enormously difficult and costly exercise. It was decided that it was possible to make improvements to the TF-30. The improved engines were adequate and effective and continued to be used in the F-14A model. But they were still worrisome, to the point that the Navy installed a low-cost but very effective alert system of impending catastrophic TF-30 engine failure. Later, F-14B and F-14D used two General Electric F-110 turbofan engines with afterburners. Regardless of the initial engine problems, the Tomcat was revolutionary and the pinnacle of what had been learned from the early beginnings of building carrier-based aircraft. The difficulty with the advancement of carrier-based planes was that every step forward in aviation required changes to the actual carrier. The development of the jet engine rose substantial problems. Jet aircraft were getting heavier and heavier with every new model. They also got much faster. This meant that their landing and takeoff speeds were higher and they required longer runways. Major changes to the aircraft carrier's shape and the procedures of pilots and ground crew were required for the jet age. 
with their weight exceeding 10,000 pounds and their high landing speeds, crash barriers were not always sufficient in preventing accidents such as this. In the late 1940s, there was a huge increase in accidents involving planes slamming into parked aircraft. To overcome this, the angle deck was employed. The angled runway permitted pilots who missed the trap wires to accelerate and go round again. This improvement also freed up the deck space to allow more planes to be flight ready or prepared. The steam catapult was another carrier addition that assisted the plane to achieve takeoff speed over a very short distance. An F-14 requires about one mile of runway to take off. On a carrier, this 30-ton plane is catapulted to 170 miles per hour in three seconds over a distance of 300 feet. Although these carrier features were employed before the Tomcat's arrival, it's interesting to note that the Tomcat was built to excel all other aircraft and it had to be created within the limitations of that day's carriers. This is the Tomcat's second test flight. Test pilot Miller is in the rear seat and Smythe is the pilot. The first test flight was a simple see if it flies affair and it was really only a takeoff, short straight flight and landing. It was uneventful. The second flight was more performance and handling based. Unlike the first flight, this one was eventful. The chase pilot noticed smoke coming from the rear of the Tomcat. A closer inspection revealed that it was hydraulic fluid. Within a few minutes, the plane started losing functions. It was basically bleeding to death. At about 100 feet above the ground and not far from the runway, the pilots were forced to eject and the plane, Prototype 1, was lost. And from the ground, it looked like this. This is aircraft number 12. It was redesignated as 1X to replace the lost one. This plane was to continue the test program and included the high speed tests. Smythe, Miller and the other test pilots were just coming to grips with the Tomcat and although there were problems, it was fast becoming apparent that the Tomcat was superior to anything before it. However, at this time, the Navy and Congress were not convinced. One of the factors for their hesitation was the cost. The Tomcat wasn't cheap, and it still had problems. Throughout 1971, testing was still in progress, and the aircraft were performing better than anticipated. The teething problems were being ironed out and the plane's sailability was looking good. This is prototype 2 going through a routine. Several Tomcats were built with no intention of flying them. They were simply created to be destroyed in destructive testing experiments. It wasn't until June of 1972 that the first carrier tests were performed. After a series of touch and goes, a landing was completed by aircraft number 10. 
Another problem arose. Number 10 suffered a hydraulic leak with the nose landing gear. This is not what Grumman needed, as the Navy and Congress were still not entirely happy with the Tomcat. This film and the result of the carrier test was to be flown to the Navy for its final decision regarding the purchase of the plane. A hydraulic leak was definitely the last thing Grumman needed. As it turned out, Congress endorsed the plane that became an aviation legend. If Congress were to have made their decision the following day, it may all have been a different story, as plane number 10 and its pilot, Miller, were both lost. The program continued, and in the later half of 1972, production began and the F-14 entered service in 1973. The Tomcat has undergone many revamps since. In November 1987, the F-14B was released and it incorporated new General Electric F-110 engines, which solved the engine problems of the A variant. B, C and D variants followed, and most of the changes in these models were the weapons and defense capability of the craft. The Tomcat was the first fighter to have the remarkable Phoenix missile system. The test operation was called 6 on 6. If the test was successful, the system would prove to be a quantum leap in fighter ability. The objective of the test was for the Tomcat's pilot to attack and down six targets simultaneously. The targets included two drones that flew at supersonic speed, three training aircraft which simulated slower moving targets such as bombers, and another ground launch drone to imitate a supersonic missile. On the radar, the six targets were identified and designated a prefix. From that point on, the pilot just pressed the firing button as the targets became locked on. At one time, all six missiles were in the air tracking their targets. This was due to the 50-mile range of the Phoenix. It was determined after receiving the test data that with some slight modifications, the Tomcat Phoenix combination would, under combat conditions, give the pilot an 80% hit rate. With the Tomcat Phoenix missile combination flying off aircraft carriers, the US Navy was very much at the forefront of carrier power. However, landing the planes was still a high-risk operation. In this incident, the front undercarriage collapsed when this Tomcat attempted a landing on the USS Forstall. The plane is still fuel-laden and probably armed. The other problem is that the crashed Tomcat is blocking the runway for other planes to land. In a combat situation, this could be devastating, as planes returning from a mission could be low on fuel, and the removal of the crashed craft would be a priority. In World War II, planes like this would be immediately pushed over the side. In another incident during 1976, two other airmen experienced a different problem. Their plane simply lurched itself over the side of the carrier John F. Kennedy. At the time, the Tomcat was so advanced and secret that the Navy decided to locate and raise the debris to prevent the wreck falling into the competition's hands. There were further Tomcat losses. Three aircraft were lost in a week-long period in 1996. This initiated a safety stand-down of the Tomcat. The Navy placed interim restrictions on the F-14 in the low altitude and high speed environments. Afterburner use was also prohibited for F-14Bs and F-14Ds.
The Tomcat probably became one of the most recognized planes due to the Hollywood box office hit Top Gun. Top Gun is in fact a US Navy flying academy. At Top Gun, the best F-14 pilots were given extra training and the chance to pit their skills against other pilots in simulated but very realistic dogfights. What's interesting is that the planes the Top Gun pilots went into competition with had been modified to give them flight characteristics of Soviet fighters. The Tomcat was much larger and heavier and it's hard to imagine a plane of such size being as nimble as the smaller fighters. In this dogfight, a modified Mongoose and a modified T-38 are to compete with the Tomcat. The 1970s saw development and production of many outstanding aircraft that are still in service with many countries. However, service life exhaustion is bringing on a slow phase-out of past legends. In the next few years, new combat aircraft like the JSF F-35 will grace the decks of the aircraft carrier. Since the beginning of the carrier, Grumman, now known as Northrop Grumman, has built many of the prominent carrier-based fighters, and although the F-35 is a Lockheed plane, Northrop Grumman are producing a number of important components of the aircraft. The F-35A is the primary model from which two other variants are derived. The F-35A was developed for the U.S. Air Force. The performance of the F-35 matches and in some areas exceeds any of today's top guns. But the F-35 goes several steps beyond any of the top guns with stealth capability, increased range on internal fuel tanks, and it has state-of-the-art avionics. These features improve the operational effectiveness, supportability and survivability of the aircraft. This adds up to unmatched combat effectiveness, enabling first look, first shot. The weapon system gives the pilot true multi-role, multi-mission capability and is designed to reduce the pilot's input regarding weapons operation. This permits the pilot to function as a tactician rather than a weapons system manager. The variant, for use by the US Marines and the Royal Navy, is perhaps the most exciting of the F-35 family. Like the Harrier jump jet, the Joint Strike Fighter has the ability to stop and hover in mid-air for vertical landings. Currently, the US Marine Corps and the British Navy use the Harrier to drop into locations where paved landing strips are short or unavailable and on British carriers. The Harrier has supplied a remarkable service over three decades, but it has some shortcomings. Engine exhaust from a Harrier's underbelly vents can kick up large pieces of material that can get sucked into the craft's air intake, and this virtually chokes the engine. The craft loses lift and crashes to the ground. To improve on the Harrier's system, Lockheed engineers fitted a lift fan just behind the cockpit. During flight, 
The fan is aerodynamically hidden behind closed doors that swivel open for landing. The jet's engine turns a drive shaft similar to a car's drive shaft that spins the fan and pushes cool air from above the plane out below. The column of cool air increases the fighter's balance as it moves forward and keeps dangerous engine exhaust away from the plane's air intake. The lift fan generates nearly 20,000 pounds of lifting power and the downward vectored rear exhaust supplies an equivalent amount. This easily lifts the aircraft. The US Navy has ordered another variant of the F-35 for its carriers. Due to the large size of their carriers, they didn't require short takeoff and vertical landing, so they opted for a version similar to the A model. The most notable difference is that the carrier version has a larger wingspan. However, due to the small size of the British aircraft carriers and the fact that they are set up for Harrier jump jets, the British have ordered the Stovall version of the F-35. The Joint Strike Fighter is capable of flying at nearly twice the speed of sound and is expected to cost between 37 and 47 million dollars per plane. The cost of the plane is one of the reasons why the JSF F-35 has been widely accepted. But it is the projected operating costs that are also a consideration for buyers. The most current data predicts the F-35 JSF will cost 40 to 50 percent less to operate and support than today's Top Gun planes. The F-35 could possibly be a legend in the making, and it could find itself in the Hall of Fame alongside the Grumman Hellcat, Tomcat, and F-111. Only time will tell. That concludes this episode of Flying Through Time. But be sure to join us again when we continue to explore our history of flight. <laughs>